Good evening, everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome to the third Neely Author Series Lecture of 2022-2023 season. My name is Kevin Garawal. I am the Vice Provost and Andrew H. and Janet Dayton Neely, Dean of University of Rochester Libraries. I'm so happy you could make it tonight. The Neely Author Series was established in 2001 to invite a diverse range of authors to discuss their recent publications, their writing process, and the ideas presented in their work. This series is made possible by the River Campus Libraries through the endowed fund by, provided by the University Life Trustee Andrew H. Neely and his wife Janet. Today we are thrilled to announce a partnership between the Neely Author Series and the Department of Psychiatry. The River Campus Libraries dedicates this year's Neely Author Series to the Department of Psychiatry's 75th anniversary. Books highlighted in this year's series support key concepts in the biopsychosocial model, which the University of Rochester doctors George Engel and John Romano developed decades ago and continue to serve as a cornerstone of training across the field of psychiatry. I want to encourage you to subscribe to the library's e-newsletter, Tower Talk, to stay informed about the library news and upcoming events, including future lectures in the Neely Author Series. A link to subscribe will be added to the chat. And I also want to thank Zena for being, for being here today to help us with the Department of Psychiatry. Momentarily, we will welcome our speaker, Dana Bowen Matthew, to speak about her book and her life in author, as an author, a lawyer, and a doctor of philosophy. Following her lecture, we will open it up to questions for the audience. Those of you on Zoom, please submit questions via the Q&A. And Dana will answer as many questions as time allows. Feel free to submit questions during the lecture or during the Q&A. Dana has offered to sign books for everyone. You can purchase her books immediately following the lecture. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Dana Bowen Matthew. Dana is the Dean and Harold H. Green and Pro Professor of Law at George Washington University Law School, a leader in public health and civil rights law who focuses on disparities in health, health care, and social determinants of health. Dean Matthew joined GW Law in 2020. She is the author of the best selling book, Just Medicine A Cure for Racial and Inequality. In in quality in American healthcare in the recently released Just Health Treating Structural Racism in Heal to Heal America, and is the co-author of a case book on public health, law, ethics, and policy. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dana Bowen. Hi, sitting there thinking to myself, now be careful because this is a nice intimate group. I might just kick off my shoes or pull up a chair and sit down and do it. Uh, I might. Check off. I really might. <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you very much, Kim, uh, for receiving this. Um, thank you, Vice Provost Farewell. Thank you very much. Also, and congratulations to the Department of Psychiatry. I have to tell you, I have spoken at a lot of medical schools and it's never the Department of Psychiatry. Right. So this is amazing forward thinking partnership on your part. Um, people ask me, have I been to Rochester before? I have, uh, but for some reason this visit is better. It's just been fun. It's been um, yeah. learning about the garbage plate. It's been <laughs> finding out who's buried in Oh my God, who knew? Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass. You'll see I had to put a Frederick Douglass slide in for those of you that were there this morning. Uh, my apologies. Um, but I'm going to talk. I'm not going to talk through all my slides because they're a little too, you know, nerdy for I think what we're trying to do tonight. Um, but I'm going to start off um, by introducing you. Uh oh, I did something wrong, Bernard. I did something wrong. <laughs> Wait, hold on. This might do it. Nope, that's not going to do it either. Okay, I'm going to, this is a, a message from the gods that I don't need any slides tonight. It's not I did, I tested it before. That's okay. You know what? Now I will get a chair. 
we're just going to add lip. Um, if you if you can get it to work, that's fine. Otherwise, I'll just sit and talk. So I was going to start by introducing you to my parents. They are uh, May and Vincent Bowen, my middle name. And the photograph that I have of them is one that was taken in Maine, even though I grew up in the South Bronx. I grew up in the South Bronx when it was the subject of across the heaven, across 110th Street, you know, movies about burnt out buildings and gang warfare and all of that stuff. Now, I grew up in a block that was kind of an oasis. We had trees and row houses. But my parents, Vincent and Marion, worked incredibly hard to buy that house for $19,000 with my grandfather and grandmother. That made all the difference because we owned a home. They, however, in order to make sure that we could own that home and that I could go to school outside of the South Bronx, died at age 47 and 60. Way too young to die. And this book is about them because I believe that in part, not in whole, but in part they died from structural racism. Right? I believe in part what led to their early death was the fact that in order to make sure that I could go to a private school as opposed to PS 123, which even today has reputation for gangs and guns and teen pregnancy and all of the bad things, right? My father had to work four jobs because not a single one of them paid a living wage, right? So one of the things we talked about was so what can you do about it if you're the University of Rochester, if you are a medical center, if you are a, um, a university, pay a living wage. And that will begin to treat the health disparities that are the result of structural racism in America. So back to my parents, they had a, a routine. And the routine went like this. My father would get dressed up in a suit, which for the South Bronx was really special walk up to the number six train, New York City, drive, ride it down to the Bowery Savings Bank, and he spent eight hours from nine to five as a real estate banker. He'd get back on the train, come home, and I was so proud to see him walking through the South Bronx in a suit. This was a big deal. He'd get home, eat dinner, go to sleep, and then put on a pair of overalls and drive to the same train and drive it for eight hours midnight to 7 a.m., right? If you do that plus add two jobs on the weekend, that's how you die at 47, right? And if he made a living wage at any one of them, then what I know about our family income was that at a year before he died, we made $29,000 on the book. So those two jobs, probably the other two were not on the books, $29,000, right? My mother worked another job. And as a result, my brother and I can stand here and have that lovely introduction, right? We can say that I'm the dean of a law school because they got me out of there. They made sure that I didn't any longer, for the first four years of my life, going to PS 93, I had to cross three interstate highways in order to get to school, kindergarten, first grade, third grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, right? If you pass three interstate highways every day, the pollution that is going to be a part of your life because of where you live is going to affect your learning as it did so many of the kids. If you not only walk to a underrepresented school or an underperforming school rather, over four highways, um, but also live in a community where most of the kids are in families that are not making a living wage and therefore don't have housing options that are positive. The structures of that set of opportunities is what limits your life chances. So one of the photographs in my deck, um, how many people remember flight 1549, the subject of that movie, Sully? All right, I'll tell you the story. Sully, oh, thank you very much. Try it again. Okay. So thank you, you guys do a lot. This is my outline. Um, 
uh, I'm going to go to my parents first. That's, those are my parents, right? Um, and I'm going to do the movie Sully. That's where I am in the slide deck. Will that work? <laughs> um, this was a plane that took off from LaGuardia Airport. It was in January of 2009. It landed on the Hudson River. And if you think about any of the lakes in January, it's not a place to live, right? You can't stay exposed to the water for very long and live. The movie's a great movie because it's a feel-good movie. There are 155 souls on board. They're all outside of the plane. They all get rescued. The captain's a hero. But if you look closely at this picture, there are really two groups of people on that plane. They've come out of the plane, and the large group in the back is standing on the wing as it sinks, the water's lapping up around their ankles. The small group of people in the front got on in first class. Thank you, Kim, I did get to ride first class. I feel like that was a privilege. Why? Because if the plane went down, look at my life chances. I've got a life vest. I've got a life raft. I've got a box that has little flares in it so I can wave for help if I'm out there in the dark. And it's kind of a morbid joke, but I tell it every time I use this slide, I've got rations. So if I'm out there for too long, I don't have to eat one another. We don't have to eat one another. We've got food, right? All I'm saying is we're all on the same plane, but if something happens, my life chances, if I'm in the front of the plane, are way better than my life chances in the back of the plane. That's what structural inequality means. And when it's highly racialized as it is in the United States, then there's a race problem that layers on top of structural inequality and I inserted Frederick Douglass because he gave this glorious speech in 1890 called the race problem. He wasn't talking about health outcomes as I talk about, right? But he could have been because the data suggests so clearly that we're not talking about a socioeconomic problem. We're not talking about a regional problem. Those are determinants of health for sure. We are talking about something very specific when we talk about a race problem. And it's because this part is a duplicate if you were there in the morning. I'm gonna keep this because this has to stay close and it has to keep working. Um, it's because of something uh, that really inspired me to write this book. And that was putting together the law, which is my first training with the science of public health, which is my second training, All right? So first the law part. 13th Amendment, everybody knows what it did. But did you know that the 13th Amendment originally did the opposite, right? So the first version of the 13th Amendment actually said not Congress, no state can have slavery. It said Congress can't abolish slavery in any state, right? So the language is blah, 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 blah. Congress may not does not have the power to abolish or interfere within any state with the domestic institutions thereof, including holding persons in labor for free, right? That's the first version. It was called the Collins Amendment. Now, the race problem basically starts here because if it were only the fact that this amendment existed as a sort of historical footnote, I don't think I'd be able to make much of an argument from it, but I can reason from it because this version, not the version that we know today, having emancipated the slaves in slaveholding states, right? This version of the 13th Amendment obtained the requisite two thirds vote in the House of, uh, both houses of Congress. The House of Representatives and the Senate both voted two thirds majorities for this version. Add to that, it was ratified by six states, not including New York. And the only thing that interrupted the continuation of the process that would have told us whether this, not the one that allows me to sit here today, would have been the constitutional amendment was firing on Fort Sumter. The Civil War began. So we don't know. But we do know that health continues to reflect the ambivalence and the sequelae of the race problem in the United States. You know, the COVID data is highly racialized, right? You know that Native Americans, Latino Americans, and African Americans, highest incidence of cases until recently, right? 
highest hospitalizations, highest death, lowest number of access to vaccination, right? So where you work, where you live, right? Densely populated houses, more likely populated by black and brown people, where you have to go to work, right? 30% of those who ride the New York City subway system are Latino or African-American, right? How you're educated so that you have employment options to do what I did during the pandemic. I stayed in front of a computer, breathing on no one, exposed to no virus, right? But I didn't have that option because I went to school in public school 123 in the South Bronx, I had that option because I went to private school and then to Harvard, right? That's how I got that option. And the fact that structurally, most people, even in Rochester, even in Monroe County, are concentrated in places where they don't have that option is what I mean by structural racism, right? That's what I mean by structural racism. These are concentrations on my right, your left, of black non-Hispanic populations by the census tract in Monroe County and on the left of Latino populations, right? And what you see here is probably the most efficient form of racism that you will ever imagine if you try to invent it, and that is residential segregation. It's the most efficient form of racial suppression, oppression. Right, this is close up the city of Rochester. I'm taking this from the New York State Health Department report of 2021. The dark areas show where in the city of Rochester populations are 40% or more Latino and African American. Right? And the light populations are outside, not even the suburbs. Again, think about my parents and what it means to income, what it means to education, what it means to exposure to pollution, what it means to exposure to over-policing. This is what the book is about, right? If we're gonna get healthy populations, this is what we have to treat. Color of health tells us the connection, right? The outcome. That in, Rochester and the Finger Lakes region, 50% more likely if you're black to experience the threat of complications related to childbirth. Three times as likely to experience infant mortality. And you see the other numbers there. Now, again, Frederick Douglass talked about this as a race problem. One of you probably is gonna ask, well, isn't this also socioeconomic? Yes, but there's a residual part of it that's not socioeconomic, right? So I'm a middle-class black woman. Let's say I make between 50 and $75,000. I'm still in the United States on average three times, two and a half to three times more likely to lose my child in the first year of life. As is a white woman who has a high school education and lives at poverty level. That's what we mean by a race problem. There's something residual about race that is connected to health disparities. And I wanted to look at that data in connection with the law, not just because the law was an answer. I wanted to be clear that law is part of the problem, <laughs> right? Created the problem, right? So if you walk across the beach and you see one dead fish, you say, oh, something's wrong with the fish. And that a predator ate something bad, had a disease. If you see the beach strewn with fish, you say something's wrong with the ocean, right? Something's wrong with the water. And I think the law has created an ocean of inequality, sustained, systemic, institutionalized inequality in our country that can be dismantled by law. Law is a very useful tool. And the point of the book is to say, not only should we do it, but if we do, we'll see better health outcomes. So that connection between the law and the health was kind of where I was going with this book. I call structural racism a system that does two things. Number one, it organizes us hierarchically, right? It tells me I'm valued here and you're valued there, 
right? Another way of saying it in a more confrontational way is that systemic racism institutionalizes white superiority, right? One race is superior and the closer you are to that race, the more superior you are. And another race, the farther you are away from it, the less or more inferior. That's the first thing. The second thing is the kicker though. The second thing is what my parents experience. It's what you experience if you think about the fact that place matters on the plane from flight 1549. The second thing that structural racism does is it allocates all the resources. Right? All the opportunity, all the education, all the clean air, the clean water to drink, the good housing, it allocates it, right? Structurally. So that's what structural racism does. And that's what it I want to tell you the role of law is non trivial. Law does a lot of work in creating structural racism. I spend a lot of time on that part in law school class. So I'll go through it really fast. This is the model that the book advances. It says law does three things. It legalizes dehumanization. It makes it legal to think of people as less than human. It legalizes inequality, makes it legal to treat people differently. And then it unequally protects the same laws applied differently, right? So legalize dehumanization. Dehumanization is one of my big contributions, I think, in this book, because a lot of people have documented the outcomes of structural inequality and structural racism. I try to think about what the reason was underlying it, because it really bugged me that good people could think that the laws were okay, that the outcomes we were looking at okay were okay. And it was social psychologists that told me about dehumanization that would make historically it okay to sell people by the pound. That's familiar dehumanization. And historically, to throw people overboard and then go recover for your lost property in court as insurance, right? The slave ship zone, that's historic. But this is dehumanization too. Right? The only thing we need to live is water, Jackson, Mississippi, Flint, Michigan. By law, we said, you don't really need water if you're poor and black in Flint. We said that you don't really need it. So that dehumanization is legal, right? In our time, that's the first thing that law does. The second thing is it legalizes inequality. Again, historically, we think of this as the Jim Crow period, right? But today, it's probably true, I don't know the data in Rochester, but it's true in New York, in New York City where I grew up. The gap between the um, funding that's available for public schools in my old neighborhood and the public schools that are in neighborhoods that are predominantly white, aggregated across all of the school districts in the country is $23 billion. So said another way, we have legally constructed a tax system that pays for school in a way that finances white districts $23 billion more lucratively than Hispanic and black districts, right? That's legalized inequality. It is legalized inequality when we see the difference in expulsion rate starting in preschool with three-year-olds. Black preschoolers were expelled three times, two times, excuse me, more frequently than their white counterparts, right? Lots of data in the book about the fact that even through middle and high school, similar behavior is treated differently. If you're a kid of color, this is Connecticut. If you're a kid of color and you're behaving poorly, you go to juvie. And that starts the school to prison pipeline. If you're a white kid, much more likely you're going to treatment for your mental health. Issues. All right. Oh, this is another example of the legalized differences in punishment in schools. Legally, that $23 billion gap means that the school I bust myself to when my parents got me out of the South Bronx, more likely had IB intellectual, uh, international baccalaureate courses, a high school band, art classes, a very well appointed library, AP classes, college prep classes, than the school that I left, PS 123. 
last example. This horrible picture is what legalized unequal protection of the law used to look like. But here's what it looks like today. So on the left, your left, my right, we see black and white people for the past, oh, 20 years have used marijuana at about the same rate. That is attractive to me as it is to you. However, possession violations, arrests for possession violations on the right side of this graph, very different if you're black, green lines, than if you're white, yellow line, same behavior. That's what I mean by unequal protection of the law. And that's what the book is about. Now, what do we do about it? Well, sort of like Thanksgiving dinner, when people come into your kitchen and it's utter chaos and they say, what can I do to help? <laughs> You're like, just pick something and do something about that thing. Do something about something, right? If you're a teacher, ask yourself, who are the kids that are getting AP classes and who are the kids that are getting shunted over into special ed, right? If you're a university, ask yourself, are the people who are working at my university paid a living wage? There are so many ways that inequality, we call it the social determinants of health, is touching structurally how people are sitting on the airplane, what their life chances are, when an exogenous hit like the pandemic that we are still experiencing arises, it hits people completely differently. If they're in the front of the plane versus in the back of the plane, if they're in that dark blue part of Rochester versus the light colored parts of Rochester, right? If you're concentrated in an area where people have not only lack of access to good schools, but lack of access to decent housing, lack of access to healthcare, over-policing, right? That unequal protection of the law. Any one of these areas is places where you can help. So this used to be how you had to fight racism. This is the cost you have to pay. And I look at these every time I do a talk because I wanna remind myself, that's how hard it used to be. It's worth it for us to keep fighting today. How? Partnerships. That's what the book is ending up doing. My effort to bring the legal side of my training together with the health and social science side, I think is the answer to addressing structural racism. Law and medicine have to work together. What do I mean by that? There are examples all over the country of hospitals like this one realizing that housing first is a solution and therefore investing in housing, right? Or partnering with affordable housing organizations. Here's another example where a federally qualified health clinic in Brockton, Massachusetts paid attention to the fact that food insecurity was a health problem and prescriptions for healthy food reduces diabetes. So they co-located, using the laws of social impact bonds, they co-located a Cape Verdean fresh grocer on the same property as the federally qualified health clinic with a test kitchen in between. So you come to the clinic to get your A1C, A1C is that how you say it? A1C check, your diabetes level check. You don't do it in a typical clinical setting. You do it with eight other patients in the test clinic while there's a demonstration of a healthy food dinner option. You finish your, well, your, your regular checkup. Part of your prescription is the recipe, the ingredients for the recipe. You walk next door to the Cape Verdean store and you get a recipe, I mean, a, a shopping list as part of your prescription to treat your diabetes. These intersections, of health and housing, health and food, health and violence prevention. These partnerships are what I mean by medical legal partnerships. But there's also something, a structure called a medical legal partnership. I can talk about that. But I end by telling you that it was not because 
Black people marched for their civil rights alone. And we got the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. It was because medical providers and other allies marched as well. And they saw the partnership that was required to address inequality, to address structural racism. That's how we did it before. It was not because civil rights activists alone sued to integrate hospitals. It was because doctors, dentists, and patients sued. This is the landmark case that desegregated hospitals, right? And so working together, even the way you vote, right, makes a difference in dismantling the structures of racism. So in the morning, I ended with a picture of Aspen's. The same thing that I said about that tree stand is true about a stand of redwood trees. They look mighty and tall and individual as organisms they're not. Underneath the ground, they're networked, they're connected. And my view in the book, is that unless we connect our professions together to address structural racism, measured by the health outcomes that tell us how just or unjust our society is, we will continue to experience the disparities that we're experiencing nationwide and in Monroe County. Thanks for listening very much. <laughs> Online. See, because I sat down, I didn't have to take off my shoe. Any, does anybody have any questions in this room? We may as well come on up. I was going to use a microphone, but I think um, we need to. Yeah, that's okay. Um, my first question is you talked about um, residential segregation and how it's like a most efficient form of racism. So here in Rochester community is, um, and other communities around, there's um, racial covenants. So underwritten laws within homeover um, paperwork, right? So how do you combat that form of structural racism? So um, right now, those racial covenants are no longer legal, but the way they're still working, they're, they're doing their dirty work, right? Uh, because uh, let me say, I'm gonna do a history first and then talk about combating it today. Um, I bet it's true here. I would have to do an oral history to make sure, but racism, in the form of racial segregation had to be invented, right? All the way up until the turn of the century through reconstruction, we didn't have segregated neighborhoods. They weren't effectively segregated. And certainly during slavery, you would be, you'd be segregated black, white on a plantation, uh, but not geographically, right? So about 1900, 1910, we started seeing segregation laws that said, you have to live there and you have to live there and you can't rent here and you have to rent there. We had to invent it by law. This is what I mean that law was responsible for it. When those laws became unenforceable, right, around 1940, then we got the racial residential covenants where by contract, we would sell a house that said, you can buy this house, but you can't sell it to you. Or if you're buying it, you can't sell it to me, right? Those covenants are still in deeds. They cannot be enforced, but they did the good, the good work of separating us out already. And then all we have to do is make sure that a couple of things remain true. One, that housing prices where we don't want people of color to live remain out of reach, right? Um, we only have to make sure that we don't invest in infrastructure so that there aren't parks, supermarkets, dog parks, right? So that these aren't recreational spaces where people wanna live and then we'll keep people segregated. It's efficient because once I put you in the back of the plane in downtown Rochester, I don't need to enforce by law that covenant any longer, right? You're gonna to go to a lousy school. You're not gonna be able to get a better job and get out of there. Your health is gonna suffer because you're going to be breathing worse air, drinking worse water, and the cycle's gonna continue through your children. I don't need a law anymore. I need a law to get out of it, but I don't need the law anymore because the history is so sound. I, I feel like you want to jump in. No, I'm just uh, amazed at that. That's just shocking to me. 
You don't need the law anymore. I don't need the law anymore, yeah. right? The work's been done. The work's done. This is tragic. The work's done. Now, I need a law to dismantle it, mm -hmm. just like I needed a law to construct it. Other things you don't need is, uh, I talked about this at the noon hour. There are bigots, there are racists, don't get me wrong, but you don't need them anymore. We really don't need them anymore, right? Because we have this unintentional, unconscious racism that the law doesn't, it winks at. The law's like, if you didn't write a memo that said you didn't want those blankety blanks in there, that's what's needed in order to do something about segregation in Rochester. Right? We know better than to write that memo. Nobody's racism looks like that. It, not, no, not very many people's racism looks like that. Anymore, right? So the law is totally out of sync with what the problem is today. And so if you want to do something about investing in downtown Rochester, right? You can't wait for people to show that they were as blatantly prejudiced as they were in 1950 and 40. But the outcome is the same. And what we've done is take the laws and made sure they don't do anything about the outcomes anymore. We have to have individual hatred. And that's how we keep people segregated. Any other questions or something we wanna discuss? I made everybody depressed. <laughs> Have you seen anybody use legislation either at the state or city level to sort of incentivize moving in healthcare to areas that just typically don't have it sure. because it is sort of centralized in, in, in places that are harder to get to? So have you seen anybody do that successfully? And yes. To turn it? Yeah, there are ways to use opportunity and innovation districts in order to bring healthcare, housing, but we use them in the United States right now. I'm gonna push a little bit. We use them more to bring technology um, and um, uh, innovation districts, right? Maker spaces, 3D print printers. We could use the same laws if we really wanted to make a difference. And the way it would work is if you remember that picture I had on, the medical committee, uh, the civil rights committee marching together, the way it would work is if I wasn't the only one jumping up and down and screaming about it, right? If my allies in the health profession, this is why I love talking at medical schools, because I want you to know that justice is evidenced by the data of health disparities. We can tell you that that's interest. So you should be out here worried about it too, because you care about health as much as I care about segregation, right? So I wanna see Black Lives Matter, right? I wanna see the National Hispanic Coalition, not only be the National Hispanic Coalition marching. I wanna see all kinds of people saying this has to change because that's when it changed in the 60s. Um, so with like the recent um, climate change, you know, conventions, things like that, the U.S. and other um, developed nations have been considering funds for developing countries for, you know, all sorts of environmental issues. I'm wondering if, and you know, it's, it's on the scale of billions of dollars, um, if there's some sort of mechanism or pathway or laws within the U.S. to address, you know, issues of environmental justice and you know, like you mentioned, crossing or interstate highways and the pollution, things like that. Um, because from an international perspective, the U.S. is looking abroad to developing countries and how to help developing countries if there's ways within the U.S. to address those issues. Yeah, I think that's a fabulous question also. Two fabulous questions. Environmental justice, some of my very, very closest friends believe is the civil rights issue of our day, right? Many of them think, and I'm not an environmental justice um, expert, um, but many think that just as in a global context, the populations in developing countries 
least responsible for creating the climate threat are disproportionately most likely to bear the adverse impact of it. I can't get the picture of Pakistan, 33% of a country being underwater, right? And the poorest of the poor literally losing their whole crop, a whole livelihood. Not because they were responsible for greenhouse gases, right? But the same phenomenon also, not but, and the same phenomenon also exists here, right? In the United States. When you think about the parts of Louisiana, Florida, the Gulf areas, Florida, right? That are going to be underwater. Those are the parts of our country that are populated by the least wealthy of our citizens, right? Um, your question is, can we use the same mechanism? We certainly have the same justification here, right? We have the same justification as we do internationally. I don't like to pit them against each other because I think we should be working for both, right? I think we as a um, net carbon producer, bear a disproportionate responsibility in and out of our country for the impact that we've had on the climate and the, and the populations that have suffered from it. But here's the kicker. We have the laws in the United States to deal with environmental injustice, environmental racism. I did do a stint for nine months at the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. They have an Office of Civil Rights. Who knew, right? Who knew that the Environmental Protection Agency actually has an Office of Civil Rights? I'll tell you who did not know, the Environmental Protection Agency, right? The air scientists, the water scientists, the solid waste scientists, they had no idea. So I'm there, the constitutional law professor, to wave my hands and jump up and down and say, you guys are spending federal money to permit pollution discriminatorily. You can't do that. There's a law. There's actually a law that says you can't do that, right? However, unequal protection of the law, that law has been so neutralized that unless we could show, I mean, we had cases that were 23 years old. Why? Because we could not show that when the EPA permitted the Genesee power plant, right? Or CAFOs, does anybody know what CAFOs are? The most disgusting agricultural waste system in pig farms and chicken farms throughout the South, right? Where they collect, I'm sorry, I'm gonna say this. I hope your dinner stays down. They collect pig poop, stir it up with water and then spray it over towns, right? To get rid of it where poor people live, right? And we had case after case after case of those people, you know, people, communities saying, I wanna sue, I wanna sue, I wanna sue. And we'd have to say, Nobody intended to discriminate against you because that's how the law has been recapped, not the impact that was disproportionate on you. So we have to change the law. We have to change it, enforce it, and then we have to have a lot of people outraged enough to bring the lawsuits and do the work to enforce the laws we have in order to combat environmental injustice. There's a lot of stories like the capos. I just told you the disgusting one. You clearly um, have spent your life trying to do something about this problem. How do you not get overwhelmed and discouraged with the enormity of it? That is so, I love these questions. It's so good. There was a period in my life when I did get overwhelmed, but I started I'm out of that period now. I don't feel overwhelmed anymore because I started to think of my life um, as part of the solution. Really, I was overwhelmed when I was futuristic, when I thought I've got to fix it all and I can't. I am the answer and I'm not, right? When you see yourself as too much of the solution, I think that's what But when you say, what do I do? So I, I, I access my faith, to be honest with you. I have a faith. And uh, part of it um, teaches me that like Moses, who stood right at the Red Sea, like, you know, um, and all he had was a staff. I feel like God said to him, I know it looks bad. You got this army behind you and a sea in front of you, but what do you have in your hand? What do you have to use? 
what do I have to use? I'm a law professor. I write about laws, married to a doctor, do a little medicine, put them together, go do what you can do. All I want to do is live every day doing what I can do, right? And then I start to feel, instead of feeling overwhelmed, I feel privileged, right? I'm like, I get to come to Rochester. Somebody in Rochester wants to talk to me from the South Bronx so we could talk about what the problems are. And after I leave, somebody might say, huh, I can do something a little bit differently. I just feel, I don't feel overwhelmed anymore. I feel overwhelmed by the privilege at this point now because you just do what you can do at any given time. Um, so I have a question actually very related to your question, which I love. Um, and I'm curious about similar things as far as environmental justice. Um, a lot of the laws that we have on the books right now, like you've said, um, prohibit discrimination, but if you can like prove that it was intentional, um, I'm really curious just your opinions on reparations as a legal framework and reparations not from a financial, like literal perspective, um, but rather as like infrastructure initiatives um, and like how that might connect to the public health. Aspect. Yeah. Um, so I added late in the day a chapter on reparations. Um, and my students who were doing the research were very disappointed in it. They're like, oh, come on, Professor Matthew, go big or go home, right? <laughs> and I was like, I got a deadline. I just need to get something in there so it's a placeholder. Because the answer to your question is I'm all for it, right? So that's why I say, for example, um, University of Rochester is the largest employer in Rochester, right? Mm -hmm. If there's poverty here, you could fix yeah. it you actually could fix it. Reparations would look like, and it's not even hard to find the population. See, that's the good thing about segregation. It's not hard to find the people you're trying to work with, right? The people who are suffering from unaffordable, severely defective housing, education, and environment, they're right there in one place. You can find them, right? Pay those people a living wage, right? Equalize the education investment in their neighborhoods. Give them pipeline programs for their kids so that they too can go to Harvard, right? We won't need affirmative action if you fix the schools, right? We need these things to fix the imbalance that structural racism has created. And when environmental racism is concerned, look at the fact that your, and this is why I put voting up there, right? Your city council, all politics is local, your school board, Who's running for dog catcher matters in people's lives, right? So if you really want to make sure that the environmental justice in downtown city of Rochester issues are addressed, you have to know who's on the city council. You have to know who's running the Department of Transportation so that when they decide to put the second, third, and fourth highway in that neighborhood as opposed to give me the suburb, the, the Tony suburb, and then, right, that you say, time out, right? I've not only read about environmental racism, I've not only looked at the data, but I'm gonna be part of the solution, right? I'm gonna be part of that Title VI Civil Rights Act of 1964 suit against the Department of Transportation that says, you cannot discriminatorily place that highway in that neighborhood. So that it's not just the people in the neighborhood that are asking for help. You go with humility, right? And say, I'm following you in protecting your neighborhood. You don't sail in like I'm the solution, but you help. And you look at the problems that, that become passionate for you, right? You guys sound like environmental racism is it. Get on it, right? That's the thing that needs doing right here. Um, there are rivers to clean up. There are power plants to shut down. Sorry, I'm making a little, <laughs> I'm leaving after five o'clock tomorrow, I'll be gone. <laughs> um, but um, there are incredible EJ activists that are 
I mean, you probably have two river, river keepers here. Contact them and say, what are, the, what are the environmental justice issues right here that I can be working on? And that's a lifetime's worth of work. That's enough right there. That's doing the thing. If you're interested in segregation, look at displacement. When, when the city council gets ready to reclaim downtown Rochester, suddenly there'll be investment money there. There'll be infrastructure, right? There'll be new businesses and new parks and new restaurants. And you can always tell when it's happening because the dog parks start showing up, right? And you say, wait a minute, why was this not worth investing? And now we're gonna price out the people who are there long-term. Don't let it happen. Go down to city hall and say, we need actually to look at the displacement vouchers and bonds, use the law, that other cities have used to make sure that longtime residents don't get placed out once you put a dog park and a swimming pool on the roof of the new place that used to be drug infested city, city center, right? Um, just said, uh, Rochester does have, or recently has a raise report on uh, racial and structural equality um, report where they, um, the Urban League is contracted with the city to kind of follow up these um, problems of structural racist um, endeavors. So like, for example, um, education, um, business, investing in black businesses in the area, such and such. So That's really good. That's really good. This question. Um, okay. So Rochester's population of education is 90% black and brown minority. So in such a concentrated area, how do you begin to fix the, the structurally created educational boundaries that these kids have to face, even though they have access to, I want to say maybe five to six colleges in the area, but they go through um, High schools were told we can't First of all, let's be honest. It's not a mystery that these kids aren't ready to go to college. It's no mystery whatsoever, right? Nobody that's serious about making sure that they have life chances that equal everybody else in this room would fail to see that the system is doing exactly what it's designed to do, which is producing miseducated, underperforming kids. No surprise. If you want to fix that school, right? If you really want to change the life chances of the people who are 90% black and brown in inner city Rochester, you have got to fundamentally change the investment in the public school system, fundamentally, right? You've got to do something that changes. So I left. I left because my school was the same as the school, my public school was the same as the Rochester inner city schools that you're describing, right? Nobody who did not leave, three families in my book, three families, nobody that did not leave is alive and drug free and has no criminal record. Nobody. It's easy to see. I'll tell you when. I'm going to I'm going to give you a prescription in a second. I'll tell you why I think this is a moment. The opioid epidemic is affecting now this version of the opioid epidemic. We've had three opioid ep epidemics. Last one was black and brown, the one before that was white women, very 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 tony white women in the 1900s, right? This one is white men and women between 18 and 25, right? And what are the characteristics that put them in the situation that they have this terrible, terrible, I mean, it's, don't get me wrong, it is a horrible exposure to drug overdose and addiction as whites, right? What puts them in that position? Guess what? It's the same dang thing that puts black people and brown people in that position. They don't have a job, they don't have an education, and these are what we call deaths of despair. But when it's white people, we call it a public health problem. When it's black people, we call it a criminal justice problem. Put them in jail. So if you're really serious about the schools, you have to start with the resources that are in the school. You have to change the fact that a kid who's exposed to trauma 
is expected to perform in a classroom setting with old textbooks, a teacher who's there for two years for Teach for America, um, a discipline policy that says what we're gonna do with you, even though we know psychiatry, your mental health status makes it impossible for you to concentrate. And when you don't concentrate, instead of treating your ACEs related behavior problem, we're gonna send you to juvenile, um, juvie, juvenile, what's it called? Juvenile detention. Once we send you to juvenile detention, you miss 10 days of school, you got a new group of friends. They're not the friends that are studying. If you're out of school for 10 days, then you've got your group of friends are the run, ones that are gonna find different recreational activities to occupy themselves and they'll be out and that's the school of prison. So you have to change the disciplinarity structure, right? You have to make, this is what I think health equity makes means. You have to make equal opportunity available even if it means unequal resources and solutions, right? So I don't need the same solutions out in Monroe County. I don't need free lunch. I don't need, I definitely, let me just say, I, I don't need police in the school. I need psychologists in the school. I need people to treat the fact that I am coming from a household that has been in this cycle for generations. If I want an equal opportunity to learn algebra, then what's needed here has to be cognizant of the, the dangers and the realities that that kid is facing, that the kid over here is not facing. I'll tell you what, when I left the South Bronx, I went in fifth grade to a white school in Riverdale. It took me an hour and a half every day, fewer than seven or eight miles apart but I had to take two buses or a bus and a train in order to get there. When I first got there, I brought the South Bronx problems with me. I was a piece of work. Still am, but it was a little worse, <laughs> right? I fought almost every day because that was the language of where I came from. I will forever, if I ever hit the lottery, that school gets my millions because they were not committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion just as a sort of tagline. They were committed to the fact that I was a different kid with a different set of problems, right? Than the kids that were living in, you know, beautiful pasture lands in Riverdale. And they were with me because they were committed to the principle of making society better. So fifth grade and part of sixth grade, all I did was fight. And they knew that they were in it for the long haul. They didn't trickle in two or three black kids and hope I did okay in the sea of white because I couldn't have. Up until fifth grade, the only white person I knew was my kindergarten teacher. So I looked at people who were white like, Ooh, you know, I didn't know what you were exactly. So they maintain to this day that school, 25% of the population is black and brown. And then the Asian population adds to the diversity. That's their commitment still, right? It's not diversity if it's all Asian and foreign born. Foreign born immigrants, I am all for it. I am all for it, right? The black descendants of slaves, that's the population that's really been in trouble in this country and bore the brunt of it, right? So that school made a difference. If you wanna do something, you have to do what that school did. You have to do what Fieldston did. You have to be committed for the long run. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Thank you very much. We're gonna close it up here. Okay. Um, uh, I'll put on my librarian hat for two seconds. Uh, a really, a book that I read that really resonated with me in regards to reparations was Randall uh, Randall Robinson's The Reckoning. 
if you haven't read it, it's definitely worth something to take a look at. Uh, thank you, Dana, uh, for providing such a heartfelt answers to the audience questions. Uh, thank you to everybody who attended both in person and online. Uh, a recording of the lecture will be shared with registered guests via email uh, shortly and will be available for the next 14 days. Uh, as a quick reminder, if you would like a signed copy of Dana's book, you can purchase one here tonight at the back of the room. The next Neely author series lecture is scheduled on Monday, January 23rd, 2023. We will be welcoming 17 year old Gitani Rowe. Gitani is the author of a book, Young Innovators Guild to STEM, available in five languages, which guides students, educators, or teachers with prescribed five step innovation process. She was honored as one of America's top youth volunteers by Prudential in 2021 and was appointed as UNICEF Youth Advocate for Sciences for Solving Social Problems such as Cyberbullying, cyber Developing Solutions for, social, for Environmental Protection. She received a grant from the National Geographic Young Explorer to expand her workshop and self-sustaining them beyond her. She's raised over $90,000 for different STEM programs, including enhancing a maker space in the Kukuma refugee camp in Kenya while mentoring students for innocent Please visit the Neely Author Series webpage on the RCL website for more information. She was also the Time Student of the Year. If you get a chance, take a look at some of her stuff. Yeah, thank you so much. This is fantastic.